Tuktwesh, Asbutai, and Hasa, and six Sea Peoples tribes joined in the attempted invasion. The alliance between the various Libyan and Sea Peoples tribes may have been formed years before this conflict, but an examination of the Egyptian texts reveals that some of the Sea Peoples involved in this war did not take part in the war against Meremptah decades earlier. The primary source for the war in 1162 BC is the Medinet Habu Temple, the mortuary temple of Ramesses III. The temple provides both textual inscriptions and pictorial reliefs that depict the various sea peoples in their native apparel. The texts and reliefs indicate that the war involved both land and river battles and also involved a migration of civilians from the Levant into Egypt. The Medinet Habu texts enumerate the Sea People's tribes in a similar fashion to the texts from Meremptah's war, but Ray provide more details and indicate that some different tribes were involved in Ramses III's war. The text from the second pylon of the Medinet Habu temple reads, The countries, the northerners in their isles, were disturbed, taken away in the fray at one time. Not one stood before their hands, from Keta, Kod, Carchemish, Arvad, Alassa, they were wasted. They set up a camp in one place in Amor. They desolated his people and his land like that which is not. They came with fire prepared before them, forward to Egypt. Their main support was Peleset, Thikil, Shekelesh, Denyen, and Weshesh. These lands were united, and they laid their hands upon the land as far as the circle of the earth, their hearts confident, full of their plans. Two important pieces of information are gleaned from this passage. First, Five tribes of sea peoples are named, Pelest, Thekel, Shekelesh, Weshesh, and Denyen. But only one of those tribes, the Shekelesh, were named in the inscriptions of Meremptah's war against the Libyans and sea peoples. Meanwhile, the Sherd and Shardana, who were listed as one of the sea peoples' tribes involved in Meremptah's war, are depicted in the pictorial reliefs at the Medinet Habu, but not mentioned in the texts. Interestingly, the Shardana are depicted as fighting both for and against the Egyptians in these reliefs. The second important piece of information is the mention of the various locales that the Sea Peoples destroyed before they arrived in Egypt. The cities are listed in such a way that it depicts the order of destruction as beginning in Asia Minor and then going through the Levant until the raiders finally made their way into Egypt. Based on this passage, the attack on Egypt in 1162 BC was the final significant raid by the Sea Peoples, and the passage from the Medinet Habu texts that relate the actual battle seems to indicate that the Egyptians were ready for the Sea Peoples. As a result of the advance, the Sea Peoples and Libyans attempted a combined land and river attack against the Egyptians in year 8 of Rameses III's reign, but perhaps because the Egyptians already knew the Sea Peoples were headed in their direction due to the intensive destruction they had caused in the Levant, the Egyptians were able to build effective defences. The Medinet Habu texts state, I equipped my frontier in Zahi, prepared before them. The chiefs, the captains of infantry, the nobles, I caused to equip the harbour mouths like a strong wall, with warships, galleys and barges. They were manned completely from bow to stern with valiant warriors bearing their arms, soldiers of all the choicest of Egypt, being like lions roaring upon the mountaintops. Ultimately, Ramses III and the Egyptians were successful in their war against the Sea Peoples, and the texts claim the defeat was total. Those who reached my boundary, their seed is not, their heart and their soul are finished forever and ever. As for those who had assembled before them on the sea, the full flame was in their front before the harbour mouths and a wall of metal upon the shore surrounded them. They were dragged, overturned and laid low upon the beach, slain and made heaps from stern to bow of their galleys while all their things were cast upon the water. The hieroglyphic texts of Ramses III's war against the sea peoples are more detailed than those of Meremptah's war, but the graphic pictorial reliefs at the Medinet Habu Temple has helped even more in the modern understanding of the Sea Peoples. Most notably, the reliefs from the Medinet Habu Temple have helped modern scholars learn about how the Sea Peoples dressed and possibly what the motive was for their second attack on Egypt. The most commonly depicted Sea Peoples on the reliefs are the Peleset and Jekka, who both wear a fillet from which protrudes a plume. The other prominent Sea Peoples tribe in the reliefs is the Sherdan, 
who are conspicuous for their horned helmets, which they were first depicted wearing in Egyptian art during the reign of Ramses II. The Medinet Habu reliefs are also important because they depict not only sea people's warriors fighting the Egyptians, but also women and children, who are shown moving in ox-drawn carts. Unfortunately, the graphic depictions of the women and children are not accompanied with text, so it is impossible to definitively determine the context of the situation. The families may have been displaced civilians from the Levant fleeing the Sea Peoples, or they may have been the Sea Peoples' warriors' families coming to settle in the fertile Nile Valley. The unknown context of the civilians brings to light another issue regarding the use of the Medinet Habu texts and reliefs as a historical source for the identity of the Sea Peoples. The modern idea of history and historical writing, historiography, was derived directly from the ancient Greeks, and the ancient Greek writer Herodotus was one of the first to write history in the narrative form. Although his and later Greek histories were flawed due to style and substance problems, the methodology provided the base for modern historical studies. The ancient Egyptians, on the other hand, recorded events from their past, but usually not in narrative form, and never to be used in a didactic or scholarly sense as the Greeks and modern scholars would write a history. Egyptian historical texts were often full of symbolism, myth, and idealised to fit a certain template, which makes the historical accuracy of both the Meremta and Ramses III's texts at least somewhat suspect. The fact that both wars were recorded in temples is also important because during the New Kingdom, when both wars took place, temples were usually replete with scenes of the Egyptian king symbolically smiting the traditional enemies of Egypt. None of this is to say that the Egyptians' wars with the Sea Peoples did not happen, they obviously did but certain details such as the number of the enemy killed, or even the resolution of the wars themselves, may be hyperbole intended for a divine audience. The ancient Egyptian textual and pictorial evidence provides a base for identifying and naming the Sea Peoples, but in order to truly understand their origins, historians have also had to employ linguistic and archaeological methods and techniques. Linguistically, it appears that the Egyptians referred to the Sea Peoples by already established names that were often demonyms, while archaeological evidence can help modern scholars determine where the Sea Peoples went after their last attack on Egypt. Since there are nine identified Sea Peoples tribes from the Egyptian texts, determining the origins and eventual placement of each one is difficult, but reasonable determinations can be made. The Peleset tribe was a major participant in the Sea Peoples' attack on Egypt during the reign of Ramses III, and at least partially due to their name, most modern scholars identify them with the biblical Philistines. The Peleset Philistines are also the origin of the more modern name for the region, Palestine, but disagreement persists over their geographic origin. Klein believes that where they lived before they came to Egypt, and then the Levant is unknown, but Wainwright argued that they originally called the region of Cilicia, which is where Asia Minor and the Levant meet each other, their home and were neighbours of another Sea Peoples tribe, the Cheka. The Cheka are a bit more enigmatic than the Peleset. With the latter, most scholars agree regarding the location of their origins and eventual home, but both the origins and eventual landing place of the Cheka are a mystery. Wainwright believed that the Cheka originated in Asia Minor, and then settled in Greece, but more recent studies have suggested that the Cheka of Ramesses III's war may have been synonymous with the Shekelesh of Meremptor's war, which means their origins may have been in Sicily. There is more of a consensus among modern scholars regarding the final destination of the Yeka. According to an ancient Egyptian literary tale known as the Report of Wenamun, the Yeka inhabited a city named Dor in the Levant. The text states, then Smendes and Tentamen sent me off with the ship's captain Mengabet, and I went down upon the great sea of Syria in the first month of summer, day one. I arrived at Dor, a Chika town, and Beda, its prince, had fifty loaves, one jug of wine, and one ox haunch brought to me. This passage brings to light an interesting fact about the Cheka in particular, and the Sea Peoples in general, because it suggests at least some of the Sea Peoples tribes were interested not just in raiding, but also finding a permanent home. The report of Wenamun is generally believed to have been composed 
during the reign of the Egyptian king, Ramses IX, in the early 11th century BC, which means that the Cheka were able to establish a city with commercial ties to other states in the Mediterranean region in less than a hundred years. Although scholars are not sure of the Cheka's geographic origins, the Shekelesh have been assigned a more definite home. The Shekelesh are generally associated with the island of Sicily, even though no archaeological evidence exists to support the claim, because hundreds of years after the Sea People's invasions, Greek colonisers of Sicily in the 8th century BC found people already living on the island known as Sicils. The Sicils claimed to be descended from Troy, almost as important as the name Sicil, which is obviously similar to Shekelesh, is the claim of Trojan descent. As already noted earlier, the destruction of Troy took place during the era of the Sea People's invasions. The Shardana, like the Shekelesh, have also come to be associated with a Mediterranean island by modern scholars. The Shardana, most notable for their horned helmets in the Egyptian pictorial reliefs, are generally associated with the island of Sardinia in the western Mediterranean Sea. Although the name Shardana is more than likely a demonym that refers to Sardinia, it is unknown if they originated on the island or settled there after their defeat at the hands of the Egyptians. Either way, the mention of the Shardana in the Egyptian texts and the representation of them in the pictorial reliefs were the last time this group was mentioned in any historical record. The Denin, or Danuna, were a Sea People's tribe listed in the Medinet Habu texts, but there were also other historical references to this group before the general collapse of the Bronze Age. Both Hittite and Egyptian sources mention the lands of the Denin as being located in southeastern Asia Minor, in the region known as Cilicia. Unlike the Shardana and Shekelesh, the name Denin does not appear to refer to any location, but some have argued that it may be the origin of the name of the biblical tribe of Dan. The idea that Denin Danuna became the tribe of Dan is a logical possibility, considering that both the Peleset and Cheka settled in the Levant after the war with Ramses III. Perhaps the Denin followed other Sea People's tribes into the coastal Levant region and eventually became part of the Hebrew Confederation. One of the least known of the Sea People's tribes is the Weshesh, to the extent that little is still known about their origins or final destination. An ancient Egyptian source known as the Papyrus Harris relates some of the results of Ramesses III's war with the Sea Peoples, among which is an interesting policy the Egyptian king took towards some of his defeated enemies. The text states, The Sherdan and Weshesh of the Sea, they were made as those that exist not, taken captive at one time, brought as captives to Egypt like the sand of the shore. I settled them in strongholds, bound in my name. Numerous were their classes like hundred thousands. I taxed them all, in clothing and grain from the storehouses and granaries each year. It is known that the Shardana acted as mercenaries for the Egyptians and actually fought on both sides during Ramses III's war with the Sea Peoples, but perhaps this passage suggests that the Weshish followed a similar path. One may find it strange that Ramses III would forcibly settle the hostile Weshesh tribe within Egypt's borders, but perhaps he coveted their martial skills as mercenaries, or he needed them to cultivate unused land. In the ancient Near East, it was common for powerful kingdoms to forcibly move and resettle populations deemed recalcitrant. For example, the Assyrian king Sargon II conquered and forced the relocation of the population of Samaria in the late 8th century BC, and Nebuchadnezzar II's similar act towards Judah about 150 years later is another well-known use of the tactic. Ramses III of May have figured that once the Weshesh were resettled within the borders of Egypt, the population would have been thoroughly assimilated within a few generations. The Luka are mentioned in Meremptor's war against the Sea Peoples, and as with the Shardana and Shekelesh, the name appears to be associated with a location. Most modern scholars now associate the Luka with the regions of Asia Minor, known in ancient times as Lycia and Korea. The Luka, like the Shardana, are also mentioned in other sources, before they participated in the waves of invasions that helped spell the end of the Bronze Age. At the Battle of Kadesh, they were allies of the Hittites against Ramses II and the Egyptians. 
but they had at that time already earned a reputation as raiders and pirates. The last two known Sea Peoples tribes, the Teresh and Ekwesh, are perhaps the most important and interesting because their descendants provided much of the impetus for the culture of the ancient Greeks. The Teresh, referred to by Herodotus as the Tyrrhenians, are generally associated with Italy geographically and the Etruscans ethnically. According to Herodotus, the Teresh originated in Lydia and then settled later in Italy. The Lydians were the first people we know of to use a gold and silver coinage and to introduce retail trade and they also claim to have invented the games, which are now commonly played by themselves and by the Greeks. These games are supposed to have been invented at the time when they sent a colony to settle in Tyrrhenia, and the story is that in the reign of Attis, the son of Manes, the whole of Lydia suffered from a severe famine. For a time the people lingered on as patiently as they could, but later, when there was no improvement, they began to look for something to alleviate their misery. If Herodotus's account is to be believed, then the Teresh originated in Asia Minor, like most of the other sea peoples, and then migrated to Italy. The account does not explain whether the Teresh were already established in Italy when they attacked Egypt, or if they went there after their attempts at conquest ended in failure. The final sea people tribe named by the Egyptian sources was the Ekwesh. The Ekwesh were only mentioned in the texts from Meremptor's reign, so there are no pictorial reliefs of them, but scholars have associated them with the Achaeans. Some scholars argue that the name Ekwesh was the ancient Egyptians' attempt to pronounce the word Achaeoi, which, if true, would have made the Ekwesh a Mycenaean Greek group. This raises a couple of important historical points. If the Ekwesh were Achaean Mycenaean Greeks, then they were at least partially responsible for the collapse of their own culture, because Mycenaean Greece was as adversely affected by the Sea People's raids as any other people, including the Hittites. Redford believes that the Mycenaean political system had begun to collapse by the late 13th century, so in an effort to revive it, some of the member states formed an alliance against Troy, which was a leader member of a confederacy of Asia Minor city-states. The destruction of Troy is believed to have happened around 1220 BC, which was also the beginning of the collapse of the Bronze Age and the mass movements of the Sea Peoples. It was also around the same time as Meremptor's war against the Sea Peoples. The connection between the destruction of Troy, the Ekwesh and the Sea Peoples goes beyond mere conjecture. A passage from Homer's Odyssey relates what the victors did after the sack of Troy. So for nine years we Achaeans campaigned at Troy and after sacking Priam's city in the tenth we sailed for home and our fleet was scattered by a god. But for my unhappy self, the inventive brain of Zeus was hatching more mischief. I had spent only a month in the delights of home life with my children, my wife and my possessions, when the spirit moved me to fit out some ships and sail for Egypt with heroic companions. I got nine vessels ready, and the crews were soon mustered. Then I ordered my good men to stay by the ships on guard while I sent out some scouts to reconnoitre from the heights. But, carried away by their own violence, they went on a rampage and immediately began to plunder some of the fine Egyptian farms, carrying off the women and children and killing the men. The hue and cry soon reached the city and the townsfolk, roused by the alarm, poured out at dawn. The whole place was filled with infantry and chariots and glint of arms. Zeus the Thunderer struck abject panic into my party. Not a man had the spirit to stand and face the enemy, for we were threatened on all sides. They ended by cutting down a large part of my force with their sharp weapons and carrying off the survivors to work for them as slaves. Although the Odyssey is an epic poem full of mythology, it contains important bits of fact, particularly how the Achaeans sailed to and attacked Egypt. The passage further states that the Achaeans were unsuccessful against the Egyptians, which corroborates some of the information in the Egyptian texts. As mentioned earlier, Druze has argued that it was a change in warfare tactics that brought an end to the Bronze Age. The less sedentary and less civilised tribes, such as the Sea Peoples, developed tactics that challenged and in some cases destroyed the old established kingdoms of the Bronze Age Mediterranean region. Possibly the most important tactic that the Sea Peoples took advantage of 
was the superiority of infantry versus chariots. In the Bronze Age Mediterranean and Near East, many of the more powerful kingdoms, especially the Hittites and Egyptians, used chariots as the bulk of their military forces. For the most part, infantry was used in a support role or only against barbarian tribes who had no chariots. In fact, chariots were considered prestigious and even a bit of a gentleman's endeavour. Both Hittite and Egyptian kings would ride chariots into battle, the most notable example being Ramses II at the Battle of Kadesh. As impressive as a chariot-led army may have looked during the Bronze Age, the Sea Peoples quickly exposed the flaws in that form of fighting and ultimately relegated chariots to the dustbin of history. Chariots could only be practically applied on level plains against other chariots, so if armies encountered hills, mountains, marshes or other difficult terrain, chariots became useless. Chariots were also expensive because several horses were required to pull a single chariot, which would require a lot of food, and Bronze Age armies were also required to carry spare parts and supplies when their chariots inevitably broke down. As a result, dependence on chariot warfare meant that peoples like the Hittites and Egyptians were limited in what they could do on the battlefield, while the Sea Peoples were not restricted by the heavy costs or lack of manoeuvrability of chariots. Chariots also proved to be much more cumbersome than cavalry, and it may be no coincidence that of all the ancient Near Eastern kingdoms that survived the Bronze Age collapse, the Assyrians actually thrived and were one of the first kingdoms in the region to rely not only on infantry, but also cavalry. In a sense, the Sea Peoples not only made the chariot obsolete with infantry tactics, but arguably provided a successful template for subsequent military structures. Another tactic that the Sea Peoples employed in the late Bronze Age was the selling of their services as mercenaries. Mercenary activity is as old as man, but the Sea Peoples used it to establish themselves in the ancient Mediterranean and gain a foothold for their civilizations. The Shardana Sea People tribe is known from textual evidence to have fought as mercenaries for the Egyptians at the Battle of Kadesh, and they were even employed by Ramses III in his war against the Sea Peoples. Some modern scholars believe that the Shardana were among the elite warriors, not only of the Sea Peoples, but also among those used in the Egyptian army. The Sea Peoples may not only have worked as mercenaries for the more powerful Bronze Age kingdoms either. Druze argues that they served as mercenaries in Marie's war against Merempta in 1219 BC, and this may have been true for some of the Sea Peoples' tribes involved in the attempted invasion, but the desire to settle in fertile Nile Valley probably was a greater incentive. The Egyptians had more material wealth than the Libyans, and could pay the Sea Peoples more for their services, but since the Sea Peoples were several different tribes, the possibility remains that a few found their way into the Libyan army as mercenaries. The Sea Peoples clearly changed the face of warfare in the ancient world with new battlefield tactics, but they also introduced new weapons that proved to be more effective than those previously used. The regions where most of the Sea Peoples originated, Asia Minor and southeastern Europe, happened to be the areas that first came into contact with the great metallurgical advances from the Balkans, which produced the long swords, shields and helmets that the Sea Peoples used. One particular new weapon that proved to be revolutionary was the flange-hilted slashing sword. The sword was first developed in Central Europe and then made its way to the Aegean, where the Sea Peoples used this weapon to wreak havoc on the Mediterranean. The Sea Peoples also wielded other new types of swords and corslets to protect them, but more important than the actual weapons they used was the access to the supplies of materials. Since the Sea Peoples controlled the coastlines of the Aegean and Eastern Mediterranean, they had a monopoly and almost unlimited supply on the copper and tin of southeastern Europe, which meant a constant supply of the new weapons they wielded. Conversely, the various kingdoms and city-states of the eastern Mediterranean became increasingly isolated and cut off from metal resources as the Sea Peoples' attacks intensified. The vast amounts of resources and the weapons they made clearly gave the Sea Peoples an advantage over their adversaries, but ancient weapons used in new ways also helped make them superior warriors. Although the Sea Peoples employed new swords that were developed in Europe, 
the rank and file of the various tribes used a long spear as a primary weapon with a dagger for support. The spear and dagger combination provided the warrior with a combination to use and meant that warfare had become much more merciless because those who wielded the combination did not intend to take prisoners. Some Sea People's tribes, such as the Peleset, were even known to carry two spears into battle. The Sea Peoples were not known for archery, but they did employ javelins in battle, which they probably developed from hunting game before using them in warfare. Finally, the Medinet Habu reliefs show that the Sea Peoples used round shields, which was a change from the more square-type shield used in previous periods. The round-type shield would be the standard shape used for several centuries. Archaeological and historiographical evidence has revealed much to modern scholars about the weapons and tactics employed by the Sea Peoples, but ironically, little evidence exists about the types of ships and boats they used. One would think that with the moniker Sea Peoples, evidence of their maritime abilities would be abundant, but only a couple of sources exist. The Medinet Habu reliefs depict a few examples of Sea Peoples' ships, but there is only one type shown in all the examples. The Sea People's ships depicted in the Medinet Habu appear to be powered by oars only, but another archaeological source may show that some of their ships may have also been powered by sails. Excavations in Tel Akko, modern-day Israel, have uncovered an ancient altar from the 13th century BC that depicts a Sea People's boat with both sails and oars. The lack of evidence regarding the ships is not that surprising, considering the nature of naval warfare at the time. Ships in that period were used primarily to transport warriors to either land or other ships, where they then engaged in battle. It was only in later periods that ships were developed to be used as battering rams against other ships. Furthermore, the Sea Peoples are so named because they came from the sea to Egypt, not based on any maritime prowess that they may have possessed. The combination of weapons and new battlefield tactics employed by the Sea Peoples especially when contrasted with the reluctance to abandon old battlefield tactics by the Hittites and other Bronze Age kingdoms, allowed them to lay waste to countless cities throughout the eastern Mediterranean region. In fact, the extent of the destruction the Sea Peoples wrought on the region was so extensive that some thriving city-states were completely destroyed and others were severely weakened. Based on all of the available textual and archaeological sources, a basic route that the bulk of the Sea Peoples took can be reconstructed. Since the Sea Peoples were a number of different tribes, they did not all follow the same route, nor did all of those who did follow the same route do so at the same time. That said, there does seem to be a general pattern. The earliest raids and destruction took place in the Aegean, and then moved eastward along the coastline of Asia Minor until the Hittite kingdom was destroyed. The Sea Peoples then went south into Cilicia and into the Levant, where they ravaged numerous cities until they turned west into Egypt. It was there that they were finally repulsed during the reign of Ramses III. Sandars believes that there were two separate groups, one based on land and the other at sea, moving in this pattern simultaneously. Sandars also believes that these two coalesced in the northern Levant, with many settling down north of the Orontes River. The violence and destruction that the Sea Peoples brought to the Mediterranean began in the 14th century BC in and around the island of Crete, which came slightly before the general collapse of the Bronze Age system. Sandars argued that the destruction at Crete was essentially a dress rehearsal, for the more widespread destruction that would come later, but it is, therefore, of some interest to this history. Sanders also asserted that an expeditionary force from mainland Greece attacked Crete and its primary city of Knossos in order to end the commercial dominance of the Minoans in that region. Although the Mycenaean Greeks were literate and their script Linear B has been deciphered, they never developed a large corpus of texts so most of the evidence of the Sea People's movements in the Aegean and Greek world is archaeological in nature. In addition, Sandars points to an Egyptian tomb relief from the 15th century BC in which a Minoan ambassador was painted over and replaced with a figure wearing mainland Greek attire. The destruction that was initially directed at the Minoan culture on Crete by the Mycenaean Greeks 
but they apparently turned on themselves in the late 13th and early 12th centuries BC because numerous Mycenaean cities were wiped out. After the Sea Peoples destroyed the Minoan Cretan culture, they then moved to the island of Cyprus and devastated that culture. Between 1200 and 1050 BC, the population of Cyprus withered, their main city, Encomi, was destroyed, and the Greek language subsequently took hold. The use of native Cypriot pottery also declined precipitously and was eventually replaced by the new styles of pottery used by the invaders. Other items, such as a one-metre-high bronze statue of God with a horned helmet, testify not only to the destruction of the Cypriot culture, but also its replacement by a proto-Greek culture. This was also the period when the famed city of Troy was besieged and eventually sacked by the Achaean Mycenaean Equesh raiders, some of whom then went on to raid Egypt according to Homer. If so, the path followed by the Achaeans would have been through the sea, around Crete, and then through the sea again, until they reached Libya. The Achaeans, Equesh, were then probably followed by the Teresh, Shekelesh, and Luca, while the Shardana, who were already familiar with Egypt, arrived on their own. Once in Egypt, the Sea People's tribes then allied with the Libyans and assaulted Meremptas Egypt sometime around the year 1219 BC. While some of the Sea Peoples headed toward Egypt, the majority of the Sea People's tribes moved eastward from Troy and Cyprus and set their sights on the mighty Hittite Empire. For centuries, Hatti, the kingdom of the Hittites, stood as a source of stability and power in the ancient Near East. At its height, the kingdom comprised much of Western Asia Minor, and its empire spread into the Levant to control several city-states of non-Hittite peoples. During the Late Bronze Age, the Hittites were one of the great powers of the Near East, along with Babylon, Egypt and Assyria. And although the kingdoms sometimes fought each other, the conflicts were always resolved diplomatically before any widespread destruction took place. However, the Golden Age of the Hittites came to a quick and violent end at the hands of the Sea Peoples and other inland raiders known as the Phrygians. The destruction wrought on the Hittites was as severe and complete as was done to Crete and Cyprus. Excavations at the Hittite capital city of Hattusas reveal signs of a terrible destruction, to the extent that the site was abandoned for centuries. Since the Sea Peoples' invasions cut the Hittites off from their copper source, they were no longer to make weapons to protect themselves. Thus, when the invaders attacked the northern Levant, it left the city of Hattusas isolated and unable to put up a proper defence. There is no Hittite historical record of the fall of Hattusas, perhaps due to the fact that the empire's destruction came quickly, but it also may be the case that Hittite scribes were unwilling to write anything that may have angered their gods. With the utter destruction of Hatti complete, the Sea Peoples then turned south into the Levant. In the Bronze Age, the Levant was a collection of several city-states, most of which were vassals of either the Egyptians or Hittites, and the largest and most prosperous of all the Levantine cities in the 13th century BC was Ugarit, which under its king Nikmadu II had formed an alliance with the Hittites and their king, Supiluliuma I. At that time, Ugarit was truly an international city on the scale of Alexandria several centuries later. Merchants from Egypt, Assyria, Cyprus and Hatti travelled to the city to trade wares and even established their own ethnic enclaves in the city. Excavations have also revealed that the people of Ugarit were literate and developed a large corpus of mythological and ritual texts. Despite being a single city-state in the Levant, Ugarit's alliance with the Hittites appears to have been a relationship of equal peers instead of one of vassal and lord, as there is no mention of any obligation by Ugarit to supply the Hittites with troops or excessive tribute payments. Ugarit may have owed its independence to its large and powerful navy that numbered as many as 150 ships at its peak, which was a large navy by late Bronze Age standards. However, Ugarit's large navy would not be enough to save her and if anything, its riches may have been what enticed the sea peoples to attack. The last king of Ugarit was named Amurapi, and it was under his reign that the city was thoroughly destroyed by the sea peoples. Unlike the destruction of Hatti, there are a number of texts from Ugarit that mention the destruction and some of the raiders. 
One Ugaritic text mentions a group of people known as the Shikala raiding their coastline, which may be a different pronunciation of the Shekelesh Sea People's tribe. One of the more interesting Ugaritic texts is a letter written by the last king of Ugarit to the king of Alasha, Cyprus, which was excavated centuries later in the ruins of Ugarit. The letter reads, My father, behold, the enemy's ships came here. My cities were burned, and they did evil things in my country. Does not my father know that all my troops and chariots are in the Hittite country, and all my ships are in the land of Lycia? Thus, the country is abandoned to itself. The Ugaritic king did not know it, but by the time he wrote his letter, Cyprus had already been destroyed by the Sea Peoples. With Ugarit gone, the Sea Peoples then moved south in the Levant by ships and overland until they reached the borders of Egypt, where they lost in battle against Ramses III and the Egyptians in 1189 BC. And after their second defeat at the hands of the Egyptians, the Sea Peoples then dispersed throughout the Mediterranean and the final chaotic chapter of the Bronze Age came to an end. With that, the Iron Age began, and new empires and cultures rose to prominence across the Mediterranean and the Near East. That was Anatolia and the Bronze Age, the history of the earliest kingdoms and cities that dominated the region, written by Charles River Editors, narrated by Victoria Woodson. <laughs>